All right, everyone, this is going to be the final discussion and lab as well uh, for this section. Uh, we're going to kind of just tidy up the last little bits of the compliance center uh, and talk about some of the kind of, we'll call them outliers, but I think they're actually pretty powerful. Uh, and I use these for all, almost all of my customers who have uh, E5 licenses. Uh, so this is one of those ones that it doesn't make sense to have a lecture around. Uh, we're just going to, it's one of those things you have to see to understand it. So we're going to jump right in. As you see on here, we're going to jump to the Compliance Center again, as we always do. Go ahead and click Show All. We're going to go to the Compliance Center. So we're just going to talk about the last little bits on here. Uh, there's just a couple of outliers that make sense. And they're actually, like I said, the two that I want to focus on the most are very powerful. Uh, but there's other ones that have, they're a little more niche. Uh, so again, we've talked about Compliance Manager, which is kind of just the dashboard on here. We've talked about data classifications, which again, gives you a wonderful snapshot into your organization. We have not talked about data connectors. Data connectors here allow us to be able to have, here are all of the connectors that Microsoft has to be able to uh, take this information uh, that is in a third party and be able to use e-discovery as well as communication compliance. We'll talk about how that kind of comes into play here, but the idea behind this is take control of non-Microsoft data. So you can see here is we can import data from apps like Slack, WhatsApp, and 60 others, as you can see on here. WebEx uh, is one of them. Uh, Facebook business pages uh, makes sense, but these are on preview. You can see a lot of these here. This HR connector, that's going to be very important. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. Uh, but you can see these ones that are on here. I'm not going to go through each one in detail, of course, but you know these make sense uh, for various scenarios. We want to do e-discovery or we want to do communication compliance on. So these are connectors. These are all API connectors. And again, you see here uh, we have none defaulted on here. Uh, we can always add more, of course. Uh, the alerts, we've talked about the alerts already, uh, just a way of kind of getting an idea of what the heck is going on in the organization uh, and being able to delegate this out to some sort of SOC team or something like that. Uh, reports, just a little helpful overview here of just usage uh, around retention labels, uh, label record, records tagging. We have nothing as talked, we didn't talk a ton about records because uh, they're kind of niche too in their own right. Uh, but label trends, you know, we can see all of these different things on here. These are just nice ways of being able to pick out informations. Come over here to policies. These are just alert policies, uh, but they'll just take us to the different sections on here. Uh, alert policies, as we have on here. Defender for Cloud Apps. I'm going to touch on that never so slightly here, but I'm not. That's actually a little bit more advanced. This is a, a true CASB or a cloud uh, application security broker. Uh, is what it's called, but it's Microsoft calls it Defender for Cloud Apps. Uh, that is a, a piece on this. We'll talk about it, of course, uh, just a little bit, though. Data loss prevention, retention, in terms of use. You know, these are all things that just kind of come, and, and they're just links to other things. It's a, kind of a silly little link there, but yeah, we can use it, I suppose, for certain. I only use it for alert policies, really, but um, permissions. These are the roles. Remember, Azure AD has their own RBAC roles, Microsoft Purview absolutely does as well. We looked at those when we assigned ourselves the uh, Content Explorer permissions. This one right here, Trials. Uh, this one is in all of them. You can absolutely, we have a Defender for Office 365 trial uh, that we're currently in. We can also do any of these other ones like Priva or any of the assessments that kind of came out there. Uh, we looked at those just a little bit in the very first discussion here, but these are trials. Microsoft absolutely has a lot of really cool things. Since we're on an E5 trial right now, uh, we would actually be able to do an E5 compliance trial for, I think it's 90 days they allow you to do it. Uh, so there's a lot of cool things that we can do with those. But uh, for right now, you have unlimited licenses, and it, um, they, I think they're still 90 days. So again, jumping through here, catalog, what is this? Well, again, these are just links. These are weird things that they have in here. Um, I don't quite, it's just kind of like a, a way of being able to jump into different sections in the compliance center. I, I don't quite understand what the purpose of it is. My guess is there's probably going to be more things added in time, but it's just, it's a weird one. Uh, so again, nothing really there. App governance. So this one here is very important, uh, but the idea behind it is we need to use Defender for Cloud Apps, which is not really something that we have discussed. That's kind of, uh, yes, it's a part of governance and compliance and security. 
uh, it definitely is a big piece of that, but it actually requires a lot more effort because we have to be able to take, uh, imagine taking, you know, this is something that, let me give you a high level explanation of what Defender for Cloud Apps does. Uh, and actually, if we come down here to more resources, we will see Defender for Cloud Apps as an option. And this is a whole separate portal. Uh, so it's portal.cloudappsecurity.com. And I don't know what we're going to see in here. It's probably not a whole lot. Um, but what this does, okay, that allows us to break it down into a couple different sections. This is a great investigation tool. And the reason why, one of the questions I ask for a lot of my customers that don't really have a good answer is, all right, well, what right now, how many of your users, or do you know if any of your users are using any kind of shadow IT? Well, how are we supposed to know if somebody's using their personal Dropbox or their personal, you know, uh, OneDrive or, you know, whatever, for Google Drive or something like that? How do we know? Well, what we do here is that we use Discover. Okay, so what we do is we take all of the information. Here are all of the applications that are inside of here that Microsoft can look for. And what we do is we have to import our data. Okay, so if we come over here and we go to uh, log collectors. So there's lots of ways that we can have logs being dumped in. We can have firewall. So we could take everything going from the firewall and through the firewall, we could take all of those logs and say, all right, here's the source, here's the destination, and here's where they were going. Uh, so we can get an idea of who's going to where and what locations. So that helps us here. Another option, and the more, I'll be honest, the easier option here, uh, is so here's the applications that we can use, you know, hey, blue coat proxies, barracudas, you know, whatever, Cisco ASAs or any of the under other bazillion of Cisco products there. You know, these are firewalls, really, that we can kind of jump into. And that's cool. Uh, these are helpful. But the problem is, is what happens when people aren't using the firewall or they're not going through the firewall? And again, we talked about that when we talked about networking. But that was back in the, the modern workplace scenario here. But that's not necessarily the uh, the best way of being able to to get this data. OK, so what if we want to be able to take information from different data sources? Well, what we can do here, and I think it is still around here anyway, as uh, so we have Defender. Yeah, there we go. Defender for Endpoint. So we talked about this here where Defender for Endpoint is a way to enroll your device into the Defender for Endpoint so we can have a SIM SOAR, whatever you want to call it, uh, scenario here. We can kind of get an idea of security posture and everything of our devices out there in the network. Uh, but what we can also do here is we can integrate this. We can integrate Defender for Endpoint into our Defender for Cloud apps, and it will take all of the data that that computer goes to and send it to the Cloud App Portal here. And then at that point, we can get an idea of where people are going and what applications they're using apart from our corporate ones. We do have the ability here to be able to go through all of them. Microsoft will give them uh, a, a risk score on a 0 to 10, uh, and just in case you were wondering, all of Microsoft's products on here are all labeled a 10. <laughs> so, of course, they are. But we have other ones here, too. So, for instance, um, let's jump down here to, like, IT services. There's a lot on this one here. But, uh, you know, hey, here is, let's see if I can find one that's relatively, let's do a search, I suppose. Uh, let's do Dropbox. That is under Cloud Storage. There's Dropbox. So Dropbox has a score of 9. So we click on it here. Uh, and you can see here's where it has, here's its kind of security. It's got a 10 in security, 10 in general, uh, which again just kind of shows that it's a legitimate company. That's about as much as I can tell from the, the general categories anymore. Uh, but security, you know, what does it do? What kind of things do it, does it adhere to? Compliance, this is where it's got a couple of, of marks against it. One in particular is Gliba. Uh, this is a financial or a banking institution uh, piece here. Uh, so you can see that some of these it, they don't adhere to. And then you can get idea. You know, this is the 4% weight in category. It's really, really small when you're looking at in the global. But, um, you know, hey, maybe if we can get an idea here, it is absent. There is no Gliba policy that they have for it. And then from a legal standpoint here too, DMCA, GDPR, you know, all of those things too. So we get an idea of what these things do and what the risk is. And then what we can do is we can sanction or unsanction uh, these apps. 
But we get the, the biggest piece here is to be able to discover where people are using their data uh, and where they're putting information to. So you can get an idea of which users, which computers, and where they're going. Uh, this is just another one of that overall security posturing here that we're able to gather data on. And if we sanction these, then they're allowed to use them. If they're unsanctioned, then we can actually integrate that into the Windows firewall. So anytime they try to go to Dropbox, it'll say that this is an unsanctioned device or an unsanctioned application and you are not allowed to use it. Now, we can only do that on corporate owned devices, of course, that are enrolled in Defender for Endpoint. So looking at it, discovering is one piece. We also have the ability to do uh, activity logs. So we can jump in and you can see, you know, here's the IP address of where I was coming in from, uh, which, you know, that's fine. Uh, and it tells me when I came in and where I came in and all of that. And I'm not going to go too much further here, but uh, we can also get an idea of files. We have to enable file monitoring here, but basically we would take all of the SharePoint OneDrive team, you know, all the file data and dump it into here as well. So think of this as like a, an aggregated amount of information here. We can also get information about users inside, outside, internal, external. Uh, we can get an idea about specific users here uh, and maybe they have uh, maybe a little more too privileged of access or maybe this is a guest account that's been around for too long. Who knows? You know, and then we can start looking at our multi-cloud security configuration here. So again, Azure, AWS, GCP, or just overall regulatory compliance, which we don't have any standards here you have to jump into. Uh, but again, you have to create these projects in order to do so. So you say, all right, well, we're also using Amazon Web Services here as well, uh, but we need to have some sort of uh, compliance related to them. And then finally here, we can actually set some policies into play. Uh, these are helpful. A lot of these things are coming in from Azure AD pieces. Uh, these other ones here, like the risky sign-ins, we've seen these before, impossible travel, unusual file share, unusual impersonation activity, uh, activity from anonymous IP addresses. So again, these are ways of being able to get information around it. And then we can also see what they did too. Uh, inbox manipulation. This is kind of a big deal nowadays is that people are logging in and, you know, they're forwarding or they're doing some suspicious things, we'll just say. So again, looking at all of this, Cloud App Security is actually really cool. And you can set some alerts here too, based off of when some of these happen. You know, is that we can actually encompass text messaging here as well. Uh, so we can get a little bit even more on the nose with some of these as opposed to just email. Uh, so a lot of variables here. This one you can go much, much further on. I'm just going to keep it that, at that high level there. So I'm just going to go ahead and close out of the portal. And then we'll come back up here to the app governance. Now what app governance does is a tie-in to the Defender for Cloud apps that shows me which apps have the most amount of privilege. And what I'm talking about are going to be uh, the enterprise apps inside of Azure Active Directory. Now we talked about those before when we talked about in the security section, uh, but the Defender for Cloud apps here will actually say that, all right, well, these apps here have uh, a lot of API access to different things. Are they needed? Are they not? You know, whatever. And we can do kind of governance around them. They'll tell us which ones are overprivileged or not. And then we can get an idea of, hey, do we want to use these or not? Maybe we want to control these a little bit more. Again, there's a lot of different things we can do there, but that's what app governance does. Audits. Now we've seen this already here uh, a little bit where we can kind of come in and I want to see during this time frame, here's all of the different things. I want to know who, uh, you know, I don't know, checked out a file or copied a file or again, there's so many of them on here. I'm not going to, I'm not going to go that far into it, but again, copied a folder, deleted a folder, created a list, deleted a list. A lot of these are SharePoint, uh, created an anonymous link. This is actually a very common one here. I want to know who created anonymous links. Where did they go? What did they do? Uh, you can see in here site permissions. A lot of these are SharePoint related, but we have Power BI. Uh, and again, there's so many other ones on here. There's a lot of power apps uh, as well. Workplace analytics. I'm not going to go through all these. Feel free to look through them. There's hundreds of them on here. And uh, you can see that. All right, well, here's the file. Here's the folder. Here's the users. And then we can refine our search here a little bit to see what they did. This is around actions that users did. Okay, so this one's a really helpful one. Content search. We've already looked at content search because when we looked at the e-discovery section, that is a content search. This one here just allows us to do a search on, you know, I'm just going to call whatever locations. Hey, we're going to look at exchange. 
And then again, we build the query and then we dump it out. And at that point there, we can look at the content if needed. These are useful in certain circumstances. Uh, it's really just for searching data. That's it. Uh, so we can look it inside of there. If we need to, we can export it as well. So that's where it gets a little bit mm, hairy when it comes to the ethical boundaries too. So, all right. Next thing I want to talk about here is communication compliance. This is an E5 only feature here, but I love this one here. This one and insider risk management are things that are so no other like company really can provide this type of information because Microsoft can actually look at the entire picture here. Uh, so communication compliance is it's not a way of viewing. It's a way of getting patterns for users. OK. Uh, communication compliance we can start with some templates we'll look at those here and we'll just go ahead and kind of get on with these here uh, we'll go ahead and dismiss so getting to know communication compliance and we can kind of jump through this once here assign permissions create distribution groups for who's you want to look for create your first policy so they have recommendations uh, take control of sensitive information in messages Okay, we uh, sent six teams and 20 email messages that contain sensitive information. Now, again, that's probably most of that's from our testing, of course, uh, but some things that they consider sensitive are going to be like full names. And as again, we've talked about the New Zealand driver license and social welfare number and all of those. Eh, are those really sensitive? Really? Probably not. But this is where we can start getting a little bit more uh, granular. So let's start talking about the policies here. So this is all around communication. Okay, this really isn't about files. This is around communication. So data flowing, data very much in motion. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a policy. And here are some options that we have. We can do inappropriate text, inappropriate images, sensitive info, regulatory compliance, or conflict of interest is a fun one too. So let's talk about inappropriate text here first. So we're going to create this and it kind of brings up this little wizard. Uh, and let's go to customize policy so this one's going to be a little bit easier here this one's going to be called inappropriate text who do we want to look for okay well we're going to look for all users or we can do specific users uh, whichever we want there in this instance we're looking across the board we probably want to look for what is inappropriate we'll define that here in just a minute uh, and then we can exclude people if we want and then we have to do the reviewers now a lot of times in this instance maybe we want to have the reviewers be specific people maybe like HR so again in this instance here should IT be looking and monitoring for naughty words probably not uh, but this is something more of an HR matter so maybe we want to have HR be the reviewers which we can do here uh, so you know in this instance here I'm just going to say Getty Lee is going to be uh, the reviewer and we do have to put somebody in here so we can hit next so I'm just going to go ahead and shoot Getty here what are the locations that we want to do remember communications only Exchange, Teams, Yammer. We absolutely, as we saw before, we have the ability to use those connectors. So maybe we want to look at Slack or WhatsApp or, uh, again, any of those that we saw that was in that. We can choose inside of here. Now, we don't have any, of course. Uh, those require some effort to get set up and everything, but we don't have any right now. We're just going to stick to the standard Exchange, Teams, and Yammer. We can detect inbound, so from the external, internal, uh, outbound, excuse me, outbound, internal to external. Uh, and then just internal only, internal to internal. So here we are using trainable classifiers. Targeted harassment, threat, and discrimination. So these are uh, kind of a pitting to that policy there of inappropriate uh, text. You know, this could be, again, any of these can kind of fit in there. Remember, these are looking at more of the demeanor of the message and the tone of the message, not looking at... Uh, you know, explicit words. Yes, of course, all of the, the naughty, you know, standard words around there. Sure, those are all pieces of that. Uh, but also the way that you are speaking in it. You know, there's a difference and it's kind of colloquial. You know, people always say in a quoting this, you know, I'm going to punch you in the face. You know, colloquially, we say that jokingly. Now, computers are a little bit difficult because when they see that and they see those texts in there, depending on the tone of the message, they may flag it or they may not. That's why we have to have reviewers in here, because is this truly a, you know, harassment or a threat or something? Probably not. But again, that's why we have to have people review it. Now, I'm going to show you here what the whole process looks like is when people do review, we, can, we have a couple of tools available to us where we can anonymize the users uh, because we take that human element out of it. 
Uh, it actually just kind of truncates their name. Global administrators, when they log in, they can see these. Uh, if they are a reviewer on here, they can see all of them. Uh, and they can see the actual users and what they say. Uh, but in this instance here, it is just going to be kind of the, the HR people coming in. So Getty Lee is going to come in and look at it. And he is going to see just kind of a, a, a anonymized name. So it takes that human element out of it. So we've looked at, here's the conditions. We also do, and this is one of the, the scenarios in which we do get to use the OCR, or optical, optical character rec recognition here. So again, if we're doing pictures or PDFs or anything like that, we can extract the printed pieces on there. Uh, so we can actually look at it and analyze it then. This is powerful, and this is actually going to be coming here to DLP and information protection and sensitivity labels and all of that uh, in time. But for now, uh, it is pretty much limited here to communication compliance for right now. So looking at it here, and then the final last piece here is review percentage. Uh, we have 100%. Sometimes uh, they're randomly selecting, so they're not picking the most egregious or anything like that. It is kind of literally a round robin. So if we put this at, you know, whatever, 10%, uh, it's going to be, you know, one out of every 10. That's it. Just round robin there. So we can do it now 100%. You may get a lot depending on the scenario and depending on what it actually this trainable classifier needs to be able to pick up. So in this instance here, you know, we got to be careful with these here too. So 100% for these probably isn't that bad. You're not going to get as many of these trainable classifier hits in your environment. Looking at next, so they even say down here you may want to do it because you may get a large number of alerts. Maybe. You might. It depends. Uh, so we're going to create a policy. So <clears throat> once we create the policy here, it takes about a day for it to kind of fully get in fact. And at that point there, it's just monitoring. That's all it's doing. Uh, and we hit done. You will see that there is a policy here for inappropriate text. It's activating. It takes some time, but it's going to do a scan on everything. Uh, and then it's just going to continuously be there for new hits. OK, so anytime something new happens, we will see it. So as you see on here, because I'm a global administrator, this is another one of those scenarios where Microsoft is trying to take out that ethical piece of it here is that I need to have a specific role to access any of these policies. I don't. Uh, now, again, we're not going to find anything on these here. There's nothing we can examine. It's really difficult to test these out here because, again, we need time and effort and it's going to take a good week or so. But in a live production environment, turning this on, it's really not going to have that much bearing because the end users have no idea this is happening in the back end. Uh, and it's just a great way of being able to capture, you know, in this instance, inappropriate content. So, again, we do have the ability to do different things here. Maybe we want inappropriate images. So, again... I'll just show you what these are here. Here's the conditions that we're looking for uh, is adult images and racy images. So we can tell. And, you know, there's lots of different variables with that as well. Uh, I've tested these out here. And of course, because I'm recording, I'm not going to do it. Feel free to test it out in your own personal lab if you wish to see if any of these things will pop up, because that's what we're looking for. Uh, we want to be able to see, are you sending, again, we'll just say explicit content to people. Sure, maybe. The next couple here are going to be around compliance levels where we're monitoring for sensitive information. Uh, what kind of sensitive information are we monitoring for? Well, we have to actually be able to kind of define that. So we have to add it. But again, these are the same concepts here where sensitive info types, we've seen these all before. You know, hey, we're looking for passwords or other things like that that are going through the organization. And as they're going, we'll get an option to, to view it. And of course, we can always customize the policy here too. Regulatory compliance, again, this is going to be around, this one's very specific, this is around a specific regulatory compliance here. So again, I think banks, uh, I think banks have to be able to, to look at some of these things here. I believe HIPAA falls into something on here too, but don't quote me on that. I'm not an individual compliance expert, so don't, don't quote me on any of those. But, um, and then the final thing here is we have conflict of interest. So this is another regulatory piece uh, based off of groups okay we have supervised groups maybe in this instance supervised groups could be managers uh, could be again some organizations for instance uh, uh, very it's a financial specific piece here where certain groups of people are unable to speak to other ones uh, and it has to deal with insider trading 
uh, depending on the size or depending on how your business is actually uh, organized and stuff. There's a lot with that one. <laughs> but at the end of the day, we can actually discover who's talking. If supervised group A is talking to B and vice versa, uh, we can get ideas here of what they're doing and what they're sending and what they're communicating. Because again, sometimes there are legal reasons why they cannot talk to each other. Uh, so again, it really depends on the scenario. So this one here is very specific, but it is for a specific regulatory compliance. And of course, we always have the ability to create this custom one here. What are we looking for? And again, I'm just going to use G. Lee here. So we can kind of get past it here just to show you, hey, what conditions are we are? And here's where it really comes down to classifiers, sensitive information type. We can do message. You know, this looks very similar to um, DLP and the MIP auto piece. You know, I'm just kind of building those condition strings. Yeah, we can do that. Uh, we can do that inside of here and get an idea of what's going on. And we always kind of, they always start off about 10% to kind of pick and choose. If you turn on sensitive information and you start looking at credit card numbers and, and all of those, you're going to get a bazillion hits uh, in a larger organization. So it's one of those things where you always kind of jump it down. 10% is perfectly fine to get a snapshot and start going through it. Once you have it set up and it's running and it detects stuff, you can come in there, and this one, as I said, it's going to take a while to activate. But you can go in there, and you can actually look and see, you know, hey, who sent it? What did they send it? And you can see the data inside of it as well. Now, sometimes it is a little difficult to be able to pick out and say, why was this triggered on here? Uh, but that is something that you got to kind of, you'll learn as you kind of go through these policies here. But um, just to give you an idea. Now, like I said, I don't have anything to trigger here with, uh, just because... It's difficult to get this to trigger, uh, and we need a lot of time to do so. It's about, like I said, over the course of Microsoft recommends about two weeks before you even start looking at these. Uh, so again, we just it doesn't make sense for do that for this recording here. But you know, putting this in here, looking at some of the pieces here, this is where we can show the anonymized version of the names. So inside of communication compliance is all that you will see this in here, but um, is that we will all we will do this here is that they'll have an anonymized version, or we can shut that off. One of the options that we can do here is if we do detect it, we can send a notice. You know, here's a notice template that just says, you know, hey, we've determined that, uh, you know, you've been sending quite a lot of threatening messages in this manner and you can send a notice or you can send it to their manager or something like that. Uh, it, it's really kind of to the point of every organization is different. Uh, I'm not going to say one way is better than the other, but you do have some templates where you can send email uh, notices to people. You can automate a lot of this as well. So, again, communication compliance really takes about, I don't know, 10 minutes to talk about, but looking at it in an actual production environment is 100 times better than anything you can ever do in a lab environment. But it is one of those great things because you can turn this on. Users have no idea that this is turning on. This is just monitoring the communications. So it's a good way of being able to see who's talking about it. But we can also start building those patterns of users. This person is you know, essentially triggered this policy 80 times this month. What the heck are they doing? Do they need to? Maybe. Do they not need to? Do they need to be retrained? Who knows? But we can get some ideas around it. So overall communication compliance, that's pretty much it from it from a top level standpoint. Uh, that's, that's it. I'm not going to go too much further on it. But again, feel free to check it out uh, in your own time, in your own lab environment and start sending some some data <laughs> between users inside the environment and see if it triggers inside of the communication compliance. It generally takes a couple hours for it to actually trigger inside of the communication compliance field. Uh, so you have to send everything, and then I just generally wait till the next day, and I'll see if it triggered. So DLP, we've talked about that. E-discovery, we've talked about that. Data lifecycle management, talked about that. Information protection, we talked about that. Information barriers, we have not talked about, and I will be completely honest with you. This is for one very specific, as I mentioned in the communication compliance, one very specific uh, financial niche where they have sections of people who are physically unable to talk to each other and virtually unable to talk to each other. Information barriers allows us to be able to say that if you are a member of group A, you cannot speak in any form or function to group B, say and vice versa. Uh, so again, and that is for legal reasons. Uh, that's what this is all about. We create the segments, then we create the policies. You know, and we say, <clears throat> you know, here's this policy is that group A can't talk to group B, group B can't talk to A, and so on and so forth. That's it. And then we just see how it's being applied. So as we see, we have nothing there, and we get an error as soon as we go on that page too, which is wonderful. 
Information barriers, as I said, I don't see a whole lot. I really don't. Insider risk management, this is one of the bigger pieces that I want to talk about as well. This is one of those powerful, along with communication compliance here, that allows us to be able to look at some really, really cool things. So the first thing that we do here is that we can have it scan logs. Okay, so this is AI driven here. We're going to scan the Azure Active Directory logs, the Purview audit logs, uh, the unified audit logs, basically. We're going to look at all of that data in there, and we're going to start getting some ideas of what the heck is going on. Now, in a production environment, I love, I start off with this one here. Let's start looking for potential insider risks. And it's going to tell us that, hey, we have risks, uh, insider risks. Now, what the heck is an insider risk? Well, let's start looking at it here. So let's go to policies. And we're going to create a policy here. So we have templates that are on here by default. Remember when I was talking about the HR connector? Well, this is where we can start looking at these things here. So here are our risks. Now we have some new things that are in preview here. Security violations, health record misuse, risky browser usage. Cool stuff. But in this instance, let's just talk about data theft by departing users. So if we look at the definition, it detects data theft by departing users near the resignation or termination date. So in order to get this in here, we have to have several things. We don't have to have the HR data connector, but that is probably one of the most important parts of this, why it's highly recommended. Uh, because again, let's just say I'm a user, I submit my resignation, and then I take all of the data that I have uh, and all of, let's just say, a whole bunch of data with me out the door. I download it all to a drive or I upload it somewhere else. Uh, and I take all of that data with me out the door. That's an insider risk, okay? That is a insider risk big time. Now, again, it could be just to the point of, you know, I want to take the stuff that I created with me. Well, maybe that's an argument to be, to be had. However, what if I am, uh, let's just say, um, I am being terminated. I know I'm being terminated. I am going to a, delete a bunch of stuff take a whole bunch of stuff and then sell it to somebody else. That's a big deal. Can we do that? Uh, well, obviously it, it really depends. And I'm not going to say in terms of one side or the other, when it comes to legality, I am not a lawyer, but when it comes down to it, that's something that we got to look at from data theft. You know, that, that is theft, no matter which way you slice it. So the HR data connector says that, Hey, this person has been given their final warning that gets dumped into Office 365, and now we flag that user. And then what we can do is, that, all right, this person turned in their two weeks notice, flag it in Azure Active Directory. All right, it gets dumped in via API, flags in Active Directory. All right, now this is kind of a risky user. So we're going to start looking at what are they doing with it as well. So at that point there, we can do, uh, that's what the HR data connector is what it's supposed to do. Uh, it takes the dates and the details and everything and throws it into Azure Active Directory and starts looking at it uh, based off of everything that they have done. Now, we'll talk about what they have done here in just a minute. Uh, we, they also want you to onboard your devices. So this will actually say, is that, hey, I downloaded all of this stuff onto my local computer. And then from my computer, I went to a USB drive or I went to a uh, you know Google Drive or something like that. We also do have the ability. This one here is fine. Uh, it really depends, you know. In certain circumstances, it makes sense. Physical badging, uh, we can actually see is that, you know, hey, when the person was, um, you know, here's, uh, they, they submitted their two weeks or they were let known of their termination and then they try to, try to badge back in or, the, you know, there's a lot of variables, but we're actually putting the physical badging system so I can get into and onto the premises. If I don't actually have anything, you know, if I don't have a place to go, this one's kind of moot <laughs> when it comes down to it. Uh, and then we're going to start looking at events so that the, the data connector imports termination or resignation dates for user. User account is deleted from Azure AD. Either one of those are events. Uh, and then we're looking at downloading files from SharePoints, printing files, copy data to personal cloud storage. Let's start looking at this here. I'm just going to call this whatever. I'm not actually going to set this up. I'm just going to call it whatever. So we want to include all users. Do we want to include a specific groups of users? It depends. Now you have to be an E5 license and your users have to be an E5 license in order to use this or else it won't work. So we have, we're going to include all users here. Now we can prioritize specific SharePoint content. Now in this instance here, it could be SharePoint sites, sensitivity labels, sensitivity types, uh, trainable classifiers or file extensions. So maybe I do. So remember, we have this here. 
Uh, maybe we want to, we don't care too much about SharePoint sites, but maybe we're a little bit more concerned about, all right, remember that top secret label that we created? We're going to prioritize that as well as maybe the highly confidential stuff. So those are going to be prioritized. If somebody who has submitted their resignation or those dates are inside of there and we're looking at that, it's going to say, all right, well, sensitivity labels, if you touch those, we're going to kind of raise that up a little bit higher because it's going to be a higher risk. We can also put sensitive information types. Uh, we're not going to put any in here now. File extensions, maybe. It depends on the scenario. Uh, and then trainable classifiers, that's another option as well. Okay, maybe. So we've basically done sensitive info types, or excuse me, sensitivity labels, because again, we've already gone through classifications and we say that top secret, that's very, very top secret. So we want to look at that. Triggers. So in this instance here, we cannot do the HR data connector because we don't have it set up. We've got to get the API set up and everything. And I don't have an HR data system to be able to set that up. Uh, so at this point here, what do we want to do? Well, we're just going to use it for the user account is deleted from Azure AD. Okay, so indicators. They're turned off by default. We do have to turn this little switch on. And we're going to turn all of them on. And then we're going to go through them here in just a minute. Okay, as you see, there are 47 indicators. So we have office indicators. Let's drop this down here. So these are indicators of things that are going to be risky behaviors. Downloading content from SharePoint, sharing SharePoint files with people outside of the organization, downgrading sensitivity labels, removing sensitivity labels. Remember, we prioritize top secret and highly confidentials. And if we see that people are just kind of en masse or even, you know, taking some of that data, uh, you know, and downgrading it, removing the labels or something, that's a risky behavior right there. Deleting SharePoint files, uh, leaving from the first stage, second stage. I mean, you can see it, it gets pretty granular down here when we're looking at sharing. Sending emails with attachments. Uh, these are new here. Teams chats and all of that's really cool. Uh, we can do that. What about device? So remember, we have to have our devices imported into Defender for Endpoint. But in this instance here, they're printing, copying, using a browser to download content from a third party site or upload files. All of this is very important information. Archiving files, uh, you know, creating sensitive files on a device, reading, copying, renaming files, whatever we want to do. Those are device indicators. Physical access indicators is that, you know, hey, it's access after termination. That's a risky behavior, of course. Defender for Cloud Apps. This is where we can start getting some of that behavior-based things here, where it's unusual mass downloading of content from a connected web app, uh, anonymous IP activity, activity after termination, multiple failed-in login attempts. All of that is risky behavior. And then at that point there, what do we want to do? So we've found the, the we'll say the triggers, if you will. <clears throat> now we want to find the indicators. So here's another indicator in detections uh, for behavior. So these are common behaviors here where we download that exfiltrate. So download data, exfiltrate the data to a third party. You can hit this little guy over it. Is that, hey, we're downloading from SharePoint or from Teams. We're exfiltrating the data. And then you can see all of these things on here. So yeah, sure, maybe we want to look for these. Cumulative file. Uh, so again, it's starting to, uh, when we start looking at the organization and norms. So we can see as a, as a mature organization, you know, on average, every user uh, will, I don't know, download a SharePoint file, we'll say I don't know, 10 SharePoint files in a day. All of a sudden, this person downloaded 500 in a day. Yeah, that's, that's a risk, you know, and that is above the norm. Same thing is that for the individual users here is it above users' usual activity for that day, not just for the organization, but for that user's normal behavior. And we can choose here what these thresholds are in the next piece. So we can use the default one, but if we customize, I'll show you what they are. So we have these sharing files from outside the organization. 10 to 20 are considered low. 20 to 30 are considered medium. 30 and above are considered high. Maybe uh, we may want to change that. Downloading content from SharePoint. 100 to 250 are considered low. I don't know. I guess it really depends on the organization here. And these are all defaults where we can change if we want. Uh, you know, is that 100 to 250 downloads uh, in a day? I don't know. That may be a lot. That may not be. That may be, I mean, 100? I don't know. 
I can't tell you, and that depends on the organization, which is why I'm bringing this to your attention. You know, downgrading sensitivity labels uh, and all of that. You can see all of these are on here. Most of them are going to fit in this, this 20, 50, 200, or 10, 20, 30. Most of them are going to fit in that, but it, it really depends. So here are these thresholds, and we can edit these two if we want. So once we do that there, we set up the policy around, okay, here's everything that these users are doing, uh, and we're going to start monitoring this. And I'm not going to submit this here, of course, because I don't really care. Again, in this lab environment, we can't fully set this up here. It's very difficult to do so. But we'll go ahead and just do progress will be lost. So that's one thing for a departed user. And again, I'm just going to give you a high-level overview on some of these templates because we're not going to dive into them. However, what we can do here is we can do just general data links. Okay, so these are just leaks. Uh, we can, here's the information, is that these are just general leaks. And these are just, we only need DLP policy set up, which we already have, and some devices imported to get the best benefit out of this. So overall here is that uh, if we do these, these are just looking for people that are oversharing uh, data or, again, theft with malicious intent. So we can get that kind of information. We looked at all those triggering events based off of the thresholds. Data leak by priority users. We can create priority user groups. We have not done so, but we can create a priority user group, uh, and then we can start monitoring them for what they are doing. Again, these are priority users, so like uh, people that deal with sensitive information all the time, uh, people that are high up executives maybe. I don't know. It depends. Disgruntled users. This is a fun one here. Based on messages they send or having experienced a stressor event, such as a poor performance review, this is that HR data connector scenario where it's going to take that information and dump it into Azure Active Directory. But it's also looking at messages they send and the tone that they send to people inside of the organization. And it's going to pick up and say, hey, this person we think is disgruntled. Uh, and we're going to start putting uh, everything they do kind of at a higher risk or riskier behavior. This is starting to get to that. In my personal opinion, I, I agree, and I think this is a fantastic thing here, looking at it with just, you know, we'll say very ethical eyes. But it also kind of goes into that idea is how much of this stuff is actually, um, you know, behavior-based, and it's kind of big brothery, really, to be completely honest. There. And that's where you got to look at it, and you got to weigh that back and forth. What is, uh, you know, where's the line drawn where this is too much? I don't know. I can't tell you that. Uh, every organization is completely different from the next. But I do have to say that is that this is all something that should be weighed upon. Security policy. These are all new ones here. Uh, is that, you know, basically uh, they're doing different things uh, on their devices. You know, maybe uh, they have alerts or something like that. Evasion or unwanted security alert is generated. These are departing users. Maybe they're trying to destroy their computer or download viruses. Who knows? You know, whatever. Again, it's all by disgruntled users. Security pollination by priority users. Again, we can set those priorities. Uh, send this one here too, which is this health record. This one's actually very helpful, but you need a healthcare connector, uh, which will jump to your EMR system. Uh, and then your HR one. So again, we can see that, all right, well, this person you know, access family health records and all of these, and maybe they're doing more than the normal or the tenant thresholds. Uh, so maybe we want to kind of put that as uh, maybe that's a misuse. We don't know. It's just kind of putting up in a higher category. Uh, so this is obviously very big in the health care field. Uh, and then we have this last one here, which is a new one, which is totally cool, uh, but it's just that risky web behaviors. You know, hey, we're going to sites that are potentially unwarranted. Uh, you can use uh, the insider risk settings of what you consider to be indicators, and we'll get to those. Actually, we'll jump over to those now. Um, once this loads up here, I'll show you. All right, so here are our policy indicators. Risky browsing. Malware websites, these are kind of what Microsoft keeps on. I, I Again, I don't know. I couldn't necessarily tell you what a cult website is, but uh, there's various. I mean, gambling, that's kind of, again, another one of those kind of, we'll say just kind of gray areas because there's a lot with this. So, again, you have to really, really start looking at here. This is, this is one of those ethical pieces. I love it. I think it's great. There's really no other solution that allows us to be able to do this. There isn't. This, this type of information here just is so so fantastic in what we can do. But again, with all that great power comes great responsibility. 
policy time frames, uh, we have pretty much 30 days uh, for them, and that's the max we can go here, and we can go backwards of 90 days. So between it is, you know, lots of different variables. Uh, intelligence, so these are, we can exclude uh, file uh, ex or file types, uh, certain specific ones are not going to be included in it. Uh, and then here's daily events to boost score. Uh, we can do 55 or, you know, whatever you want to do there. And then alert volume, we can have these be more alerts. You're going to get a ton of alerts. Default, which is kind of, you're only going to get medium ones. Uh, highs and mediums, excuse me. And then this one here is going to be huge. You're only going to see high alerts, and that's it. Uh, then we have to do our defender integration here. This is where we set up an unallowed domains. So, hey, you are not allowed to go to these sites. Uh, and that's what these are for. Allowed, unallowed, and then third-party domains. We can also do file path exclusion. So we are not monitoring specific file paths on a local computer. And then the same thing with SharePoint site. And any type of keywords we want as well. Okay, do we want to export alert details? So this could be into a SIM. And we talked a little bit about what a SIM is, uh, but you know, if we want to uh, look at uh, events and everything and dump this to a third-party SIM like Sentinel or Splunk or something like that, we have the ability here to dump that over as well. Priority user groups here, which is what we said before, is that like, hey, these are managers or these are executives, so they're priority users. We can do priority physical assets. Uh, these could be buildings, rooms with the badging system. They could be priorities. Like, say, someone's trying to get into the building is just kind of a standard one, but somebody trying to get into the server room, that's a priority physical asset. One of the cool things about this, and I'm just going to go very high level on this one here, is Power Automate. Uh, we can do Power Automate flows around these things too. Maybe we want to automatically shut off access or, I don't know, do something with it. Power Automate, sky's the limit. In terms of what we can do and I, I'm not going to talk any more about it because I, I can do an entire course on power platform so teams just do we want to integrate teams with it yeah it's probably a good idea to do so uh, we will integrate teams communications inside of this as well probably a good idea uh, okay so scans will run daily here this is just a you know as this goes in the forward we have the policy set up and we're only being specific there but maybe we want to get other analytics and other things that it has found we can turn this on uh, so you can see right here is that it's all scanned anonymized so uh, what happens here is that it'll run daily and you'll be able to see okay well here are you know potential risks and determine which policies we want to set up like oh well you just saw that you know this many people you know downloaded from sharepoint you know maybe, maybe we want to start looking at policies around that who knows admin notifications and you can see here's the information when do we want to send alerts uh, we'll call them aggregated mail uh, we can do this based off of our groups Insider Risk Management has an RBAC group, Analyst and Investigators. All three of these have RBAC groups, and you can say that if you are a member of these, this is where, you know, this is when you're going to get it. So by default, it is going to be when the first alert is generated for a new policy, and then a daily alert for high sensitivity ones, or high severity ones, excuse me, and then weekly alert, that's up to you, and they're all turned off except for just the first one. <laughs> so just to stop inundating you with these things. So... With that being said, Insider Risk Management is a great tool, allows us to do a lot of things here. We looked at all the settings here. We, you know, again, from a policy standpoint, we didn't create anything, of course, but, you know, it'll start looking once we kind of create it. Easy enough. Moving down the list here, and the last few that we're going to talk about is... Uh, records management. We talked a tiny bit about this in the retention side thing. This is around event driven uh, retention. And we see over here where we have events. Uh, this is where a event would be dumped in via API. That contract XYZ has been completed and is no longer valid. And at that point, any type of uh, uh, trigger that is on any type of label, retention label out there, uh, will automatically start the retention process. Disposition here, we've seen already, is that when things are ready to be disposed of, if I am a disposition reviewer, I can come in and I will see, all right, here I can dispose, thumb up, thumb down, depending on the stages and all of that. Looking at it, policy lookup, this is the exact same thing we see over on data lifecycle management. Adaptive scopes, well, we've seen these already, this is the exact same thing over there. Label policies, guess what? 
It's the same thing that's over there. <laughs> and then file plan here. This is where uh, we're creating, and you can see here we have a little bit more information on these here, uh, but we are basically having our labels. That's all, and that's really it. So records management is kind of as a whole just another, we'll say a couple ancillary pieces from the data lifecycle management. I don't know why they don't really combine these two, but um, it just is what it is. Last two things I want to talk about, privacy risk management or PRIVA, as it's referred to as, is a, even if you do have an E5 license, you need a uh, additional license on top of this. <laughs> so this is for ways of being able for users, and this is for non-IT people to be able to determine what kind of private data you have in your tenant. Uh, and it is a way to be able, it's really just designed for, like I said, non-IT people. It is very, very dumbed down, uh, and there's not a lot you can do in here except for kind of just look. Uh, but this does require a specific license, and it requires an additional one above and beyond. Subject rights request, same concept here. This is part of Priva, uh, where, hey, I'm a... Uh, I want to know what kind of sensitive data you have on me or what kind of personalized private data you have on me as an employee or me as a person, and I want to see that. Well, that's what I can do here. So it's based off of privacy conflicts, and users can say, hey, give me, you know, I want to know these things. So it's just all about risks and, and privacy. You know, this is a big deal for California, uh, New York, and again, I suspect the United States will also follow through uh, as a whole and probably have a global one or kind of a universal one across. So... Uh, with that being said, that is it. That is the entire purview center. We've talked about the last little bits and bobs there. Uh, the insider risk management and corporate or communication compliance, I think, are two powerful tools. But again, those are only E5s. Uh, all of that uh, is the last pieces here is just the settings, which we've already talked about device onboarding. Uh, you just turn it on here and anything that is in, uh, enrolled in the Defender for Endpoint will show up under here. Uh, and that's it. We can see other resources here. They just take us to different places. Service Trust Portal, Security and Compliance, uh, Defender Portal, Azure Active Directory, just different places. This is where Defender for Cloud Apps is as well. All right, that is it. That is the last discussion we're going to have here on the Compliance Center. I certainly hope you've learned a lot. This has been a lot of information. Uh, and... Uh, you know, with that being said, we are all done here. So I definitely thank you for your time here on this course. And I will look forward to seeing you on another one. Thank you.